I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Black Wolf Renaissance Podcast. Your boy, David Bella, one fourth of the Black Wolf Renaissance, checking in with my co host for the episode. Jalen, how you feeling? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy, Jalen, man. Another quarter of the Black Wolf Renaissance. Feeling good, feeling great, man. This is about to be a fun episode. Ooh-wee. Yeah, man. Definitely been waiting on this one. But uh, really just want to, before we get into that, just ask everyone, you know, please rate, comment, review. Just let us know how we're doing. Make sure that you get your opinions in there and just let us know so we can yeah, keep yeah. on doing our thing to help you guys out. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and with that out the way, y'all, we got to introduce our guests, y'all. So look, this week on the pod, we got a longtime friend of the podcast, one of our favorite people, man. We we work with this lady. She is great. So she's the owner of Management 24, a marketing copywriting firm. Uh, she's helped her clients do over two million in yeah. sales with this copyright firm. She is also uh she she does a lot in the digital real estate space, man. My lady, Miss Maria Lloyd. Maria, how you doing? I'm good, guys. How are you? Are you We're doing, doing great. Doing great, doing great. Can't complain. Happy yeah. to have you. How Likewise, happy to have you on this podcast. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for thank coming you for on. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, we and, we, and for we, being a so, client. So, I hey. love my clients. <laughs> shout out to Brother Dre for making a connection. Y'all already yes. know. Shout hey. out to Andre C. Hatchet, my boy. Yeah, love if, him. You, if you already know, Brother Dre is a plug. He's he done been hey, on the pod man. twice, man. If y'all ain't heard the episode with Brother Dre, you sleeping. Yeah, man. y'all go, 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 go back and listen, listen to episode 11 and episode, I think it's 84. Yeah, he, he Dre is literally one of my longest clients. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's been around literally since I launched the business in like 2015. I launched in 2015 and started working in it. Uh, full time in 2016. He was like literally my second client. Hey, sh- once again, hey. just shout out to Dre. I man. know. I if, love if y'all him. don't know him, y'all definitely, definitely tap into what he got going. He's a great brother. Yeah, Marie, I'm glad you you was kind of touching on it, like your start. So let's can for everybody that's not familiar with you, can you just give them like an introduction to yourself and how you got started in this this creative copywriting space? Yes. So in short, I tell people what I do for a living is I create wealth with words. And that's just a really cute way of saying I'm a copywriter. Um, And it's not a lot of people get that confused with copyright. Like if I author a book, then I, you know, send it over to the United States Copyright Office. It's not the same. Copywriting is an occupation in which you actually write text with the uh, number one objective of selling something. So even if I'm writing a speech as a copywriter, I'm selling the vision of the speaker. Mm -hmm. If I'm writing copy for email for you all's company, for example, I'm selling a product or a service that you all are offering. So copywriting, the, the biggest difference between that and other occupations in the marketing field is that we actually provide the words that generate the sales. And how, how do you find your way yourself into that field? Well, um, shout out to my alma mater, Clark Atlanta University, the heart of the AUC in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, So my freshman year, I actually did not know that you could make it a a living from writing. Like I've been writing since I was six years old. I still have my little diaries from first grade. And of course I feel too grown to say I, I have a diary now. So I still journal to this day, but I didn't realize I could make money from it until I went to Clark Atlanta and I had several internships in the music industry and people are like, yo, you can write. Do you mind writing my bio for me? Do you mind writing the text on my website for me? And I was like, sure. You know, and so I started hustling on the side. I had work study at the time, but I was also hustling on the side, actually writing bios for aspiring hip hop artists and DJs in Atlanta, writing copy on their website, even writing papers for some of my friends. And I was like, yo, I did not know that I could make money from this. And I started reading about it. And sure enough, I found a book um, that talked about copywriting. And that's when I was introduced to the field of copywriting. Hmm. Do, you, do you remember that book name? Oh, you know what? It's actually behind me. Um, it oh, is... Stay ready. Stay ready so you don't have to Gosh, it's somewhere behind. Here it is, right here. This book right here. It's titled The Everything Guide to Writing Copy. I literally bought this when I was in college over 10 years Mm. ago. So now I'm dating myself. But um, (laughs) that's the book um, that really kind of helped me understand what is copywriting as an occupation. And it's just been 
onward and upward, up, onward and upward ever since. I like that saying. Of course. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and happy belated Founders Day, my uh, dear brother. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> but that's beautiful that you were able to take that, that side hustle that you were doing while you were in school and you were able to transform like a few years later. Now you're able to start your own business mm -hmm. and really get it popping and really just start helping other people create and build streams of income through the words that you're doing on the paper. And uh, I kind of want to go a little bit deeper into that because you say, you know, you're really selling for people. And a lot of people don't understand that a lot of great businesses, they all have copywriters. Mm -hmm. So I kind of yeah. just want to touch and really just drive home the fact of why that's important to becoming a successful business. Well, I mean, again, your copy is directly correlated with your sales, you know, and as a business, you cannot survive without sales. You need sales to survive as a business. I mean, unless your business is in the business of bartering, but even still, you're still selling a service in exchange for another service or product, right? Mm -hmm. So copy is, it, it really is the foundation of a sustainable business. You have to be able to use words, whether that's writing a script for a video, whether that's email marketing, whether that's captions on your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, you have to be able to know how to put words together so that it attracts your audience and it incites some sort of action. With this copyright, like you said, you, you first, you finished this book and I know you already had some jobs coming in. So like, when did you decide that you were going to make this a full fledged business? Yeah. Like, was that, did you graduate and start it or like, what were you doing? So I have always known I would be an entrepreneur. Um, mm -hmm. When I was five years old, I was taking, I'm from Mississippi. So I was taking Mardi Gras beads and turning them into little puppies and selling them to my classmates. Plus I am the daughter of a, of a former Kingpin, Mario Lloyd, shout out to my father who served in life in prison, first time nonviolent offender. Um, and so I just have that entrepreneurial gene in me. I've always known I was gonna be an entrepreneur. Once I realized that I have a gift for writing, because again, it was second nature for me. I had been writing since I was six years old. So once I realized that I was actually unique in that field of copywriting and knowing how to put words together in a very crafty way, um, I graduated Clark Atlanta in 2008, which was the worst year to graduate with a degree, especially in a creative field. So I did hop around a little bit. I actually took on some human resources jobs. Um, and then finally in 2012, I actually started working in my industry. So I started out as a freelance blogger mm -hmm. and then it just took off from there. So, okay. I, that that kind of lead me into my next question I have for you. Cause like you, so you started off as a freelance blogger. Like I'm guessing how would somebody get started if they wanted to be a copywriter? Like, cause yeah, you just named a few ways that it could be implemented mm -hmm. into your business. Mm -hmm. But like, what are a few ways that if you wanted to be a copywriter, you can just start monetizing that skill? So the best way to start is obviously with your network. Um, we have the internet. I mean, there is virtually no one that cannot be reached online now. I've had clients as far out as Nigeria and some that were right next door to me in my, in my office space where I'm re uh, renting out my office. So, you know, it's, you start with a community, you find a community online, um, if you know some business owners, you ask them, do they already have an email marketing plan? Do they have somebody that's writing the text on their website? Do they have somebody who's actually writing the captions for their uh, Facebook and IG captions and stuff like that? You start there. Also, I am a firm believer in joining online courses and communities that are centered around your occupation. So if you are interested in copywriting, I recommend that you you look into someone like Ryan Dice, a digital marketer. He has a, a course for copywriters. Also his book, Invisible Selling Machine, which I know you guys, we've talked Blue. about this before offline. It's a fantastic book. It's one of my favorites in terms of copywriting, right? You start doing your due diligence. There's also an association and forgive me if I'm mixing up the last two letters. I think it's A-W-A-I or it may be A-W-I-A, but mm -hmm. that's an association for professional writers. So they actually give you a guideline contingent upon your experience to let you know how much you should charge for whatever services you're offering in this space. So I would just say, you know, if you're interested in starting out as a copywriter, if you're interested in, in penetrating that field, first of all, 
start doing your due diligence by reading books about copywriting. Again, the everything guide to writing copy. This one kind of gives you a breakdown of the, of the different fields you can get into. Take a couple of courses, hone in on your skills, and then network. Get into these online communities and just let people know, listen, I'm a new copywriter. I'm willing to do a couple of pieces at a, a discounted rate um, to build my portfolio and go from there. The sky's the limit. That's a, that's a major thing you just said right there, like with starting out. I think people discount that too much, like that just reaching out to people and being like, hey, look, I'm just start being honest with them, honestly with it. Like, yes. hey, I'm just starting. I know I can do some stuff. This is what I'm going to charge you because it's still a business. I can't do this all, all the time for free. Like I just, we talk about doing work for free, but you can't do everything for free if you're trying to start a business. Mm -hmm. And like showing them like, hey, you can get this. I can provide you this value. And now you keep starting to build a portfolio this way instead of just trying to go for the job all the time. You know, people always think you got to like put in an go application. Go for the closing, yeah. Like, 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 and not even just like that, like to get work as a copywriter or just as anything, you got to go and like, put in an application at this company or like go and do this. Like you can mm -hmm. just do, like you said, start with your network. Exactly. Yeah. You don't have to go through some company. And honestly, half of the time, the companies are already looking for somebody with experience because they don't want to train you properly. So you may as well go ahead and tap into your immediate network first anyway, because mm -hmm. if you do try to go get a job as a copywriter at a company, they're going to instantly ask you how much experience you have because they don't want to train you. At least if you work with somebody within your network and you're giving them a discount, it's, it's really like a mutual exchange. Look, I'm not super versed in this field yet. You're getting a steep discount. Just kind of work with me. Let's work together so that I can help your brand and you can help me become better at what I do. You get what I'm saying? It's a mutual mm -hmm. exchange. But at a company, they're expecting you to come through the door already with that experience so that they don't train you. So you may as well just tap into your immediate network anyway. And I also heard of an example, I don't remember where I was, but I was somewhere probably on YouTube watching a video. This guy, he was like, he was fresh to copyright. And what he did was, he was like, look, I'll do this for free. If I start turning you sales though, at least start compensating me for like maybe 10% or whatever. And he was like, he ended up making 10 bands off of that one transaction. He's like, because I showed them my value mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. it returned to them tenfold. So they had no choice but to pay me. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a route that you can take. Um, even with my business, sometimes if a client is cash strapped and doesn't necessarily have, can afford my fee for copywriting, what I may do is broker a, 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 a hybrid is what I call it, a hybrid deal in which contingent upon their audience size and the cost of their product or service, I'm willing to take a lower payment up front and then get all my money on the back end. Cause I'm confident. I know that I'm going to convert sales. I'm not worried about that. I just want to make sure that they have the right audience size. And they also have a product in which if they give me 10%, like you're the guy that you found on YouTube, I need to know that that's 10% of like a $5,000 product. You get what I'm saying? Or it, it needs to be at a certain price point for it to make sense for me. Marie, I do kind of want to go into copywriting some a little bit more. So like, you talking about like making creating words and I know you mentioned like driving people um to to do specific action so can we talk more about like that part of copyright like how as a copywriter do you get people to take action that's a really good question the core skill set of a good copywriter is empathy period mm -hmm. we are masterful at empathy we have to be because if you think about it and I actually I jokingly tell people I'm an actress on paper because if you think about it, we have to assume the voice of our client, but then we also have to empathize with the struggles or issues of our clients' clients or customers, right? So that duality in which we have to kind of navigate these different spaces, it forces us to have like extreme empathy so that we can touch them. Now to more directly answer your question, you, in my opinion, this, you know, you could ask another copywriter, they may have a different opinion about this, but specifically as it relates to email, I always focus on one call to action. Mm -hmm. There's a book titled The Power of One, I believe. I can't remember the name of the author, but they talk about how having just one thing that people can focus on will generate a much higher success than trying to lead them to two or three different calls to action. So that is my methodology um, for helping my clients be successful is in every time that I write copy, even if it's for a website, there's one central call to action that I'm driving them to. 
even mm -hmm. if you go to my website, you'll notice book a call, book a call. There's one call to action, even though there's all this other text on the screen, you know, when you visit my website, there's one thing I need you to do. And that's to book mm -hmm. a call. So mm -hmm. that's really the, 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 uh, epicenter, if you will, if you will, of copywriting in terms of being able to drive those conversions is just focusing on one call to action. So like when you say one call to action that like you're, do you mean you giving them specifically? Cause I mean, somebody may not be, be familiar with the call to action, True. like one link or just like one hyperlink, one button, but that's the only thing you're giving them to click on, on that page. Everything else is just readable. Exactly. Exactly. So literally I'm telling them to do one thing. I'm not telling you to click here and read my blog post and click here to buy my book and click here to schedule an appointment. I'm telling you to schedule an appointment. That's the one and only thing I want you to do when you come to my website, for example, or again, with the work that I do with you all. When I'm selling one of your courses or a product or anything that you all have, I want them to do one thing, click here and sign up for the course. You get what I'm saying? So it's just one central call to action, one central action take or whatever step that I need them to do. I like how you kind of keep going back to the email marketing because what we got was a story up into you being a blogger. How did you find yourself moving into the email marketing uh, side of things? And I remember you told us you took that trip to Cali for Entreport, right? Can you kind of talk about what it was like to invest in yourself with that too? Absolutely. Um, anyone who is interested in launching a business, you got to know you got to invest in yourself. Um, you are your most valuable asset, period, in life, in business, in everything that you do. Your most, you are your most valuable asset. So what I did, and it, it wasn't easy, I'm not going to lie at the time, I had just, you know, like I said, I launched the business in 2015, and I, I literally invested $4,000 in myself mm. to fly out to Santa Barbara, California, and get versed in this CRM called Entreport. And I was out there for a week. And you know what, I was embarrassed to admit it then, but I'll say it now, I actually failed the test. I went out there for a week got trained from like 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. every single day in Santa Barbara, California. And at the end of the training, you had to take a test. I failed the test. Um, and so I had to come back home. At the time I was living in North Carolina, I had to come back to North Carolina, study the material a little bit more, take the test remotely, and I passed it. So I've been an Entreport certified consultant ever since. But I just really do want to drive that point home in life. You are your most valuable asset. So you should constantly be pouring into yourself, whether that's reading text, whether that's listening to podcasts such as BWR, whatever it is that's going to empower you, you need to take that in because you are your most valuable asset in business and in life. So that's what I did. Um, one of many, and honestly, guys, every year, I strive to spend at least four figures on me and empowering myself, whether it's through education, whether it's through books, a conference, whatever it is, I spend at least four figures a year on empowering myself. Because how can I charge my clients a certain fee if I'm not even willing to invest in honing my skills? You get what I'm saying? So every single year, I'm investing at least four figures in making myself a better business owner and making myself a better woman for society. Talk I gotta get them again, man. Talk she tried my gems right up. I think it's really, really impactful though. Like you're saying though, you gotta be willing to spin that bread and really just invest in yourself because once again, that's an underlying theme I see for anyone who comes on the show. They took that time to really invest in themselves. Uh, whether it was the time, some sacrifices that they had to do, they had to really get in some books and really just learn or like you're saying they had to go spend this money on themselves they had to do something mm -hmm. in order to put everything that they had within themselves so they can make sure hey i'm i'm going to be successful mm -hmm. uh, marie i kind of want to go back into entreport some too because we kind of touched on it but like you said you got certified in the crm so but anybody that's not familiar, what is a CRM? And could you kind of go into like entreport some and like how it leads to email marketing? Sure. So a CRM is an acronym for customer relationship management. 
And basically what a CRM does is exactly what it stands for. It manages your customer base. So for example, when you go to a website and there is a pop-up screen that comes up asking for your email address in exchange for some sort of discount code or maybe to join a newsletter, that stuff is typically powered by a CRM. Now, the way that I use it in my business is really, it's because it's so robust. Um, I use it in a lot of different ways but I'll just bring up one example for now. So I own an affiliate blog. Um, and so when people come to the blog, they enter their email address to get my lead magnet. And for those of you who don't know what a lead magnet is, it's essentially just a, it's like an asset or it's like a, um, I'll, I'll use this as an example. It's like a, an ebook that you can download to read and something that will help you reach some sort of goal. Whatever your issue is, it's gonna solve that issue. So when they come to one of my affiliate blogs, they get to download this lead magnet. And then after that, they get a series of emails that come after that. All of that is fully automated by the CRM. These are emails I've written literally last year or sometimes three or four months out in advance. And so every single week or monthly, depending on where they, how they signed up, where they came through, um, they get these emails automatically. Also, what the CRM does is it actually has these, what they call triggers, where if the person opens the email and clicks on whatever links I have in that email, then it fires off another action. Again, all of this is fully automated. So anyone who's listening, if you are a business owner, I highly recommend that you get a CRM as soon as possible because what CRMs do is it cuts down on the amount of time that you have to invest in your business. Once you set up all those automations, the software literally runs your business for you so that you can do the parts of the business that you actually enjoy. So I highly recommend CRMs. Oh, wow. yeah, Entreport, for anybody listening, I know you said you went to the conference and everything as well as like getting certified, like why Entreport, uh, why was that the direction that you decided to go as far as specializing? So I had looked into some of the other leading CRMs like HubSpot. I had looked into at the time Infusionsoft. I think they changed their name to Keep now. And I actually worked in Infusionsoft for a while. And that software was just not user-friendly for me. Now, I know people who've made seven, eight figures using Infusionsoft. Again, for me, for whatever reason, I just couldn't get into it. I didn't like the interface. It looked a little archaic for me. Um, Entreport, what I really liked about Entreport was not only the interface, but I also liked the team behind it. So the president and founder of the company, Landon, is super engaged in the Facebook group. When people raise questions in the Facebook group, nine times out of 10, Landon is in there responding to the questions. So when I went out there for training, not only did I meet some of his senior staff, like literally the first, you know, one to 10 employees he hired when he founded, co-founded Entreport, but also I met him. He came and spoke to our group and let us know how the business was running and basically welcoming us, you know, as part of their family. And so I was like, you know what? I'm sold on this. I, I love Entreport. Again, it's very robust as much as much, uh, most CRMs are. But for me, the interface is just more user friendly. The other ones, I just couldn't get into them. I kind of want to go back to the email marketing part now, because like how, how, what was your first client with the email marketing and how did you find that? Okay, this is exactly what I want to use my copywriting for. So my first client uh, at the time was a re reputable scholar, um, a public scholar. And so with his audience, he was reaching Black Americans, those who are uh, honestly pretty similar to your audience. So Black Americans who are interested in learning how to create generational wealth, entrepreneurship, excelling in business, et cetera. So what really let me know I was on to something is I had written an email and within that one weekend, he had made five figures off of that one email. Mm. And I was like, whoa, you know, I mean, again, I was already writing in 2004 as a freshman mm -hmm. at Clark Atlanta University. So I knew that these things made money, but I was like, wait a minute, you know, I only wrote like 500 words and do made like five figures. That's crazy, you know? And that's when I realized the power of email. I'm like, oh yeah, I need to like focus most of my attention over here because clearly this is where the big dollars are. And it's not to say that there's not money in writing copy for 
Facebook ads and stuff like that, because there is. I write copy for Facebook and IG ads too. But <laughs> I, I see your face, Jalen. Oh, hold on. We, yes. We're going to talk about yes. that later. <laughs> we can. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, you know, there, it's not to say that there's not money in those spaces too. I'm just saying that for me, email just makes the most sense. I can be more casual in email. Again, contingent upon my, my client. You know, I've had clients that are more formal, more corporate. So obviously I don't use slang. But even when I was, you know, kind of onboarding you all, I asked, hey, can I use profanity? Is that part of your vernacular? Because if it is, I'm going to put it in the emails, right? Mm -hmm. So I really liked email and I, I still love email to this day because it doesn't really take a lot of words to put one together. And then secondly, the results oftentimes are instantaneous. I mean, it's like a, it's like having, and I know you all read this in Ryan Dice's Invisible yeah. Selling Machine, but it's like having your personal ATM. The moment Real you tough. send out those emails, you instantly start seeing people buying. And that is a very gratifying experience to see those sales coming in. So I love email. It seemed like it's, and, and with all the different copyright spaces, one of the best ways to create wealth with words, like you were talking about, because I'm thinking about that example, you because whenever you're talking about Ryan's book, that's what I think the example at the yeah, beginning that's is what, what really illustrated yeah. for us. Like he made an example in the beginning of the book where like him and his buddy, I think they were golfing yeah, or something. They were golfing. And they had made a bet. And the guy was like, uh basically Ryan was like, Hey, look, I can write you some emails and make you some money right now. Cause he's worried about making money. Like, let me show yeah, you how the to friend, make this. the friend didn't have it, and yeah. Ryan did have it. Yeah, and Ryan was like, Look, come with me. And I promise you, if we do this, I can make you some money in like 30 minutes to an hour. He's like, nah, man, you're bullshitting me. So then he sent out the emails and then he ended up making like 20 bands. Yeah. And it was just like, what the? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, obviously I, I do want to kind of level everybody's expectations. It doesn't mean literally mm -hmm. I write an email, I'm making five, six you know, figures every time an email goes out. The most important component of email marketing is your audience. That's the most important thing. So you have to actively seek to get these people's email addresses, mm -hmm. because if you get the wrong audience and I'm sending them a message that doesn't really resonate with them, then that's lost money, you know? So mm -hmm. I do want to be very um, clear here in saying as a business owner, or even as, as a personal brand, if those of you who have a following on social media, just like the BWR has a following on social media, you want to have a mechanism in which you are actively capturing people's email address and their cell phone number mm -hmm. so that's my piece on that and i'm, I'm really glad that you oh no i was just going to ask like as far as audience what do you mean by the wrong audience you mean telling my cousins and everybody on facebook to come shop with me isn't the right people who do i need to be hitting up very good question so this is a i i'm actually glad you asked this because i want to let people know I have seen a lot of new entrepreneurs get on Facebook, blasting their family. Ah, you know, you be thinking family gonna support you, but my family don't support, they didn't buy. Listen, you don't want your family and friends to buy your product or service if it does not fit them. If they're not a good fit, you actually don't want them to buy your product or service because guess what? You're not gonna get good feedback, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't serve them. It has to serve them in some kind of way. So instead of getting offended that your family and friends aren't buying your product or service, just focus your attention on the people who will do that. And guess what? If nobody's buying it, it just means it's whack. Let's just be real here. It's whack. You need to rebrand. You need to do something to make sure that you find an audience where your product or service actually resonates with what they need or what they want. But if you're not getting sales, that's on you. That's not on your family and friends. Don't put that on them. Because mm. as the business owner, the onus is always on us to successfully convert. So don't turn around and point the finger and say, oh, black people just dumb. You'll go spend money with the Chinese man, but you won't spend it with me. I hate that. No, I'm not spending it with you because for whatever reason, your product, product or service does not resonate with me. Don't blame me for that. That's on you. So mm. yeah, man, you got to find the right audience. Like that's on you, that's on us as business owners. We cannot get mad at people when they don't patronize our business. It's on us. Mm -hmm. hey. Talk to because that, it's so real though, because like it, it's never it's never the customer's job to find you. You yeah. gotta find the customer. And I kind of want to go into like with the email some, because I know you mentioned the wrong audiences. Uh it's something we talked about with you before, 
privately. Be, be, before we move on, okay, I want to, yeah, you got? because I wanted to talk about what she said about if you have an audience on social media. Right now, a lot of people think social media is the end all be all, but they don't understand the powerful the power of email marketing and how much more direct you are. They don't understand how sometimes they are fighting against these algorithms where they're only showing it to a certain percentage mm -hmm. of their following versus if you send out a mass email, it doesn't matter. People Everyone it. is going to at least receive it. They not might, they might not open it, but they're at least going to be able to receive it mm -hmm. on, on Instagram. If we post a post, not Three, all 380 of our followers, 80,000 of our followers, they're not about to see that. Only between 10%. <laughs> one to 10% of our following mm -hmm. will see that. Not all 100, however much it is, God damn it. All of those people are not going to see it. But you building that audience in your email campaign, that's vital to you being able to really just touch your core bases and your people who really going to patronize your business. So I just wanted to like, whenever you say you didn't want to get into that, I did want to get into that because it's so important. I see a lot of people saying email is dead and things like nope. that. And I just wanted to drive home that it's really not. And Jalen, honestly, I'm actually glad that you're taking the conversation in this direction because I want to speak very directly to the listeners now and let you know, you do not own that audience on Facebook. You do not own that audience on Instagram. You do not own that audience on Pinterest, Twitter, et cetera. You do not own that audience, period. Like they will shut you down. If they don't like something that you do, whether intentionally or unintentionally, guess what? They will wipe out. How many influencers have we heard of their pages? Millions of followers and fans being gone. And guess what? They are SOL because mm -hmm. if you have not been capturing that audience via email or text message, you can forget about it. You got to start from ground zero. And it's so tragic when that happens because people get so comfortable on these platforms thinking that, oh, this is my space. No, that's Facebook space. That's Mark Zuckerberg's space. Like, like, like let's not get it twisted here. That's Mark Zuckerberg's space. That's not your, that's not your platform. That's his platform. You mm -hmm. are helping build his dynasty, right? So the beautiful thing about capturing email and cell phone information or a mailing address too is that you have now democratized media. What do I mean by that? When you have an urgent message that you wanna get out about your brand or about yourself, you can literally go straight to the, to the source. It's direct to consumer. You don't have to go through Mark Zuckerberg's platform to let somebody know what you got going on. So you literally alleviate media, period. You don't need mainstream media. That's the beautiful, the beautiful thing about social media is that it has literally almost invalidated actual media platforms like ABC, CBS, because now we can go direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. Beyonce want to get a message out to people. She don't have to go to ABC or Disney or whatever to get her message out. If she had, and I'm sure she has an email list, she can send a, a, a message directly to her list. So, I mean- the title that her husband built and send you a push notification. Mm. Right, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, and another thing too, is that you all got to understand by you all, I'm saying people who are, who are tuning in, your email list is an asset. Why do you think Mark Zuckerberg got in trouble when Britannica, whatever the company was in England, ended up getting all this data? Data is the new gold. Don't sleep on it. Like it's the new gold. So make sure.
so all of that, I kind of want to pivot a little bit with all of this talking about, you know, owning your audience and things like that. That's pretty much digital real estate, like he said. And another big thing that, you know, we spoke about was you being into flipping domains also. And you basically use your knowledge of copywriting to help you in that field. Can you kind of break down what is flipping domains and how you're using copywriting to help you out? Absolutely. So the gift about being a copywriter is that words are everywhere. (laughs) So, you know, I mean, I'm always going to be employed because I'm always going to be able to make money because words are everywhere. We need words. We use them all the time. So with that being said, domain flipping is very similar to flipping a house. Okay. Let's say you purchase a house, you, you, you purchase a a house at an auction at a discounted rate and you decide that you're going to resell it for maybe 10, 20% more than what you purchased it for. Same thing with domain flipping. So, and I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a novice in this space. I'm mm-hmm. just going to be very transparent. I am a novice, but I know enough to where I have made, you know, a little good chunk of change. So back in February, I was having a conversation with my dear friend and mastermind partner, Shola Abidoy, shout out to Shola. And I was telling her that in the past, I've worked with a funeral home and funeral homes generate quite a bit of money. Like $5,000 contract for them is nothing because a funeral is going to run about 10, 20, you know, thousand. So she said, well, why don't you purchase mortuarymarketing.com? And I was like, that's a good idea. So I looked it up and sure enough, it was available. Cool. Bought the domain name, cost me about $22 because I added the little privacy protection, all that extra stuff. Well, about two months later, a gentleman reaches out to me. He visited my website because with domain owning, although I pay for privacy protection, all of that, you can see some information to know like what company owns this domain and stuff like that. So somehow he found me. He looked me up, looked up the domain rather, and he found me because I installed a chat bot on my website, on my company's website. So he chatted in with the chat bot. So I went over to Messenger and I responded. He was like, hey, um, are you going to be using mortuarymarketing.com? And I was like, yeah, I intend to, but what, you know, what's up? And he was like, I want to buy it. My father owns a mortuary. He's been in business for 20 years. And I would just like to know if it's for sale. And I'm like, I wasn't selling it, but, uh, you know, what's up? <laughs> so he was like, uh, give me an offer. So, you know me, I'm going to go pretty, you know, I'm trying to think through this. I'm like, okay, this is going to be my first little domain flipping, you know, let me, let me, let me try to shoot for the stars. So I'm like 5,000. Why not? You know what I'm saying? So he says, that's too, that's too high for me. Uh, The most I can do is a thousand. So I'm like, okay, you know, not bad, but it ain't five racks either. So I'm trying (laughs) to play tough. I'm like, uh okay uh five thousand is a little too low for me um Mm -hmm. can we go can we meet somewhere in the middle maybe 25 and then he disappeared for like two weeks no he disappeared (laughs) so then i was mad because i'm like dang i spent 22 dollars. i was tripping i was being greedy like i could have gotten a whole rack like a whole band just for a 22 dollar purchase so i followed up with him i'm like are you still interested you know i'm open to you know, negotiating, keeping the negotiations going. So he finally responded. He said, listen, the the most I can do is 1100. I'm like, cool, let's do it. And so literally I ended up selling the the domain. Again, I spent $22 back in February, March and sold it in May for $1,100. So, I mean, it's real estate. You know what I'm saying? People sleep on this stuff but it is real estate. This is digital real estate. And it's actually less liability than owning tangible property. Not that I have anything against real estate, owning land, homes, and things like that, but I'm just being honest. The entry point, the, the, the barrier to entry is a lot lower because it's inexpensive and you can get very high returns on your investment. So it's a low risk, high return investment vehicle. So that's my little story on domain flipping. I haven't sold anything else since. That was, you know, we're in what, 2020. So that was March or I'm sorry, May, 2020 when I, when I got the money from him, but um, I haven't sold anything since, but I have over 70 domain names. So 
because I'm a copywriter, I have the skill set of putting words together in a way that, you know, people it, it's, it's catchy or, it, you know, I think about words from a totally different perspective than the common person, because I do this for a living. So a lot of my, like some of my domains are like, uh, uh, faithbasedhelp.com, jobhunthelp.com. Um, and recently I actually tapped into the crypto domain space, which is something that a lot of people aren't talking about. So in the hmm. same way, cryptocurrencies have decentralized the banks. Now you have the blockchain decentralizing the internet. So literally I went and bought up a whole portfolio of dot crypto domains and my domains are based on a central theme. So I have visit Cape Town dot crypto visit Joburg dot crypto. All of my domains are centered around African cities because I believe that Africa is on the rise. It's going to blow period. So Man, go ahead. What, so what'd you say, David? Go ahead, David. Because I know why he said that. I, literally, just yesterday, I was hearing about like how money is Af Africa is no longer on paper money. Nah. Like sub Saharan Africa, they don't do paper money. They are using cell Text, phones yeah. and they basically texting money to each other. So that's just crazy that you just said that. Like, damn, that's smart. But please continue. And look, I do want to tell the audience the dot crypto space is still wide open. It's like literally probably only a, not a few thousand, it's probably up to like 50,000 or so at the time of this recording, but it's wide open. That's why I was able to buy domains like visit Nairobi dot, com, uh, dot crypto rather, visit, uh, what was the other one I bought? Oh, visit Accra dot crypto, right? That's why I was able to buy that. I even, I even bought visit Chicago dot crypto. Um, and again, just like with the dot com domains, you can sell these on the market. So I've actually had my dot crypto domain sold on the market. So, you know, it's, it's real estate. It's real estate. Mm -hmm. And how, can I ask, how, how do you transfer the ownership of this? Like, how does that work? Very good question. So inside of whatever system you use, not system, whatever website you use to actually purchase your domain names, there's a way that you can actually get like that person's email address and there's a whole process for it. It's pretty easy, honestly. You would be surprised. Like it may sound kind of uh, very difficult because it's all technical, but honestly, it's very easy. Once, so I sold my .com domain through escrow.com. I opened up an escrow account, basically followed their little prompts. Again, it's very, very user-friendly, honestly. Um, and within a matter of a week or two, I had the money. So. I mean, it was very straightforward. So whatever platform you use to purchase your domain names um, and whatever platform you use to actually sell that domain name, honestly, they usually have a nice guide written out that teaches you how to go through that process. It's, it's not intimidating at all. Uh, and I know the next thing you kind of already mentioned it, it was the affiliate blogs mm. to tie into the uh, owning the digital real estate. And I know one of the blogs that you were telling us you're partnered with is According to Hip Hop, correct? Yes. Now, According to Hip Hop is not an affiliate blog, though. Um, okay. But I am partnered with that brand. And so basically uh, with According to Hip Hop, we so that is like a it's a media company. Um, so we have close to like a million fans on Facebook, um, steadily increasing our YouTube and, and IG pages and things like that. But that's not one of my affiliate blogs. My affiliate blogs are theblackinvestor.com and grabthegun.com. Hmm. And basically what an affiliate blog is, is it's built. So what I'm doing is I'm building an audience around these brands with the intention to sell. Again, just very much like tangible real estate. I go buy a home at the auction. I actually pour $20,000 into the home and then I flip it for 60,000, right? So that's essentially what this is, what I'm doing with the affiliate blogs. You can get upwards to 10 times the value. So what I have to do is grow the audience around the blogs and then and monetize that audience through the blogs. And you do that with affiliate sales. That's, what called it, that's why it's called an affiliate blog. So I have affiliate partnerships with, of course, Andre Hatchett, owner of the Black Real Estate Notary Business School. I have affiliate partnerships with Dr. Harnett Bokrizian. She is an Africa business uh, consultant. She owns the Africa Business Academy in Import Export Africa. Um, I'm an affiliate partner with uh, Discover Your Options. That's Jay and Jackie Johnson. So I have all of these affiliate partners I've brokered partnerships with so that whenever someone comes to the website and they read content on the blackinvestor.com that they like and they actually click on the link, the blog gets a percentage of the sale 
for that particular product or service. Hey man, this this all kind of flexes and all kind of <laughs> ways just to really get a bag out here. And I'm glad that you're speaking to this because a lot of people don't really look into that. And I'm pretty sure there's some college students who's really good at writing and they can really benefit from this. Mm -hmm. Or even if you're not in college, like anyone can benefit from this just because, man, like it doesn't take much to get started with these mm -hmm. things in the digital space. Like she was saying, it's a low barrier entry. Um, could right, you speak to like about, yeah, I was about to say, could you speak about like how much would it start to like just start up a blog? So I would say your starting cost for a blog. First, you have to, of course, buy the URL. URL is going to run you about, I would say $12 max, uh, but that's $12 per year. So your URL is going to cost about $12. You need some hosting to host your website on. That may run you about, eh, you can get hosting for about $150 a year. Um, then you have to pay for the content. Now, if you're not writing the content, see, I wrote most of the content on the Black Investor, but then I did hire, I hired some journalism students at Clark Atlanta University to write content for the Black Investor. And then I hired a copywriter out of Nigeria to write content for grabthegun.com. So you need to, of course, you know, factor in those expenses. So let's say that my bloggers are being paid about $50 per article. Right, so you have to factor that in. I would say to start a blog, if you're not going to pay somebody else to write the copy for you or to write the content for you, you're looking at about probably like, I would say max $300 to start a blog. That's just to start the blog. Now, it's not enough to just start the blog. Mm -hmm. You have to actually drive traffic right. to it, right? That, that's the key. Now, that's where the bulk of your expenses are going to come from. I haven't gotten to that point with either one of my affiliate blogs yet, because like I mentioned, I have bloggers right now that are putting content on it. So I'm in the content phase. I'm going to mm -hmm. build it up to like 30 pieces of content, and then I'm going to start running traffic to the blog. Mm -hmm. So the traffic is the most important part here. So the traffic can run you anywhere from, you know, if you're running ads on Facebook, depending on your audience, that's another thing, it depends on your audience because Facebook runs on an auction, just like Google ads run on an auction. So if, you're, if your audience, if your target audience is in high demand, then you can expect to pay more money. If your target audience isn't in high demand, then you can get a good bang for your buck. But I would say a good budget to start with for ads would be, I would say about $30 a day is a good budget to start with. Uh, okay, so that's about, you know, a thousand a month. Um, now, there are some ways that you can run free traffic to your blog, and that's through strategic partnerships. For example, you are my clients, right? I can come to you and say, hey guys, you know, I I'm running this, uh, I'm doing this thing with the Black Investor. I just want to know, can I borrow your audience? Can I pay you essentially a fee to use your audience to drive traffic to my blog? That would be less expensive oftentimes than actually paying Facebook or someone else to, or some other platform to run traffic to your blog. Or you all may just look out for me on GP and say, yeah, we'll run a couple of emails, you know, to put traffic towards your blog. So again, going back to the network piece, you probably have people in your network who have an audience. So that could be a low cost way to drive traffic to your blog. If you just go to your network and say, hey, this is what I'm doing do you mind running traffic to my blog? And they may do it. Oftentimes I find within my network, people are very supportive. So when I come to them and I ask them, can I run traffic to this offer or this blog or whatever, they usually come through. So I would start with your network if you're cash strapped. If you got a little money to spend, I would spend at least $30 a day on Facebook IG ads. I'm so happy you, you picked up on the part about like the uh, affiliate websites and affiliate blogs, though, because I, I really, really am a big fan of those because of like what you said, as far as being able to like make good amounts of money for you making the content. And it's just that digital real estate, you only have to make it one time, especially when it's like it can be done creatively. The way that I first heard about affiliate websites was a uh, PC part picker because uh, mm. I had a friend who was building a website. And I didn't realize I went on there because it's just a tool. If you go on that website, it's just a tool that helps you match. If I'm getting this type of processor, let me make sure that I get uh, this, you know, other piece that'll fit with that whenever I'm building a laptop. But I didn't realize that, or building a computer, but I didn't realize that 
all of the Amazon links and different links on there, although PC Part Picker is a tool, all of those are affiliate links. So they're getting paid every time you're purchasing tools, but you need their website to figure out what tools you need to buy. So like, I just thought that was one of the smartest affiliate websites I had ever seen. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, you know, it's not you again, and I, David, I think you, you brought this up a little earlier. It's about value, right? It's not mm. enough for me to just have content on grabthegun.com or the black investor com i have to actually provide value with that so with the black investor.com for example the value that i'm bringing to the table is listen these are creative and innovative ways for you to make money listen you need to look into africa africa is growing it's robust rwanda is calling itself the singapore of africa you need to get in now while it's affordable right so i'm bringing value to the table it's not me just running traffic to a blog post where they're not going to walk away learning new information and that's why it's so important to make sure that the content on the blog is actually valuable. It's not enough to just have content on the blog just to be having it there. You got to make sure that when people read that article, they need to be empowered. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, obviously, going back to that call to action, having a very clear call to action, driving them to actually convert into a paying customer. The rule of one. I'm, the I'll rule of listen. one, man. It's real. Hell yeah. Um. And I think that's pretty much all the points that we wanted to talk about today's podcast. Yeah. So we can make the pivot to the last section of the podcast. My favorite section, what's on your timeline? So is anything that you could have saw this week, last week, anything, something that you just feel like you want to speak about? Well, what's been on my timeline a lot lately is the controversy that happened in Dallas, Texas. Uh, hmm. The restaurant owner snapped out on some women that were twerking. Um, that's been on my timeline. Very interesting perspectives on that. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's what's been on my timeline. What did you think about the whole situation? Yeah, yeah. You know, as a business owner, um, I always hold business owners to a higher standard. I have worked with some very disgruntled customers. In fact, most of my career in this freelance slash entrepreneurial space, I typically work with black clients, typically speaking, not to say I haven't had clients in other ethnic groups, but usually 98% of my clients are black. So I have dealt with being cursed out. I have dealt with being accused of stealing money from clients. I've dealt with those things. And my job as a business owner is to diffuse conflict, not incite it, not add fire to fire. And I felt his response was so demeaning. And so it was just as ignorant as the people who would not listen to him when he calmly asked them to stop twerking. Like to me, his response was just as ignorant as they were. And as a business owner, the onus is all. So like I said earlier, as a business owner, the onus is on me. Mm -hmm. If I got people in my restaurant cutting up, twerking, I need to change the music. I need to enforce a dress code. And I might need to have a person who's dedicated, and usually this is your general manager, who's dedicated to just walking the floor, talking to customers, and just kind of building that atmosphere of classiness, if that's the audience I'm targeting. So I thought it was peculiar that, okay, he said he wants to build an upscale environment, which is cool. But you're saying you want to build an upscale environment plan, throw that ass in a circle? Come on, bro. Like, that doesn't make sense to me, right? That doesn't make sense. As a business owner, we all know that, first of all, music controls the tone of any, the environment or the tone of any environment, period. So why would I want to play in a classy environment? Why would I want to play throw that ass in a circle instead of Mozart or Beethoven? Like, why would I, why would I want to do that in a classy space? So... I think he was in the wrong, but I also think the ladies were in the wrong. Like, come on, we're grown. Like, if he came over there and told you don't twerk in his restaurant, just respect the man's wishes. I would have actually called the authorities and had them escorted out because he went over there nicely two times and asked them to stop. They didn't stop. But I also think we can't pathologize Black people. Like, I've seen a lot of people going in on Black women. Oh, well, you can't shake your dirty ass in a restaurant. And oh, my. <laughs> See, like, wow. Like, oh, I've oh, I've read a lot of crazy. Stuff. Do yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, people go in. Okay, it's a lot of pathologizing. I've seen women saying, "We tired of black men pol policing our bodies." Come on, sis. 
it's not about policing black women's bodies. This is this man's establishment. It's a business. He doesn't want them twerking. He has the right to say, listen, I don't want twerking in my restaurant. But again, his response, I'm always going to defer most of the responsibility on the business owner. You don't meet fire with fire. So mm -hmm. as a business owner, I think he should have diffused the situation instead of having his DJ stop the music and he making this whole scene and all this. He should have diffused the situation by, okay, he went over there twice. They didn't, they didn't respect him. Cool. I'm calling the authorities. Now I'm coming back to let you know you have five minutes to get out of my restaurant or the authorities are on the way. That's it. See me? I'd have had security at the door. He did have security at the door, man. I don't <laughs> think they just security. Security don't be doing their job like they're supposed man, to be. That's if a I am paying you, you gonna do your damn job. Wait, he had he had security? Yeah, they gotta do. I would oh, for context, I went to True Kitchen yesterday, y'all. Uh, it's a cool vibe. I I think they didn't have throw that ass in the circle playing, so that was a good thing. They well, had a live performer. <laughs> she was in there singing cover. It was like a cover band. They were singing songs. It was a nice vibe. I enjoyed it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they had security at the door, like a bouncer looking dude, you know, big swole dude. Well, sometimes uh, they're getting though. thrown out like it was Uncle Phil, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody <laughs> is going home. Yeah, he gonna be doing this in my nice establishment. Yeah, I, I will say though, like I think it is a nice establishment. I do think that like they have a vibe going on there based on what I observed outside of what what events we saw earlier uh, earlier this week. I think the vibe was nice. Obviously, it might be a reaction to all the backlash and things that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Like I went after. I don't know what it was like before, but I will say I enjoyed it. And I think to me, it, this just 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 me. I think the part that really pissed him off and got under his skin was the fact that she was standing on his shit. I think that really <laughs> just made, because that made me mad. I was like, why is you standing on this man's furniture? If you were sitting down, if you was on the floor twerking, I don't think he'd have been just as mad. But you standing up on his on his chair, beating on his wall, twerking like, damn. <laughs> this was no, going too was, much. That was the part that made me kind of understand his anger too. Like, I agree with you. Like, it was definitely on him to be the more responsible mm -hmm. party of the two. But like, that was the part that I kind of understood where he got mad. Cause it was like, all right, cool. I asked y'all nicely the first couple of times. And then the third time you go get up on the table, like, all right, you just, you, you fucking with me at this point, right? Like, <laughs> right. you're just I trying mean, to get this. <laughs> I get the anger. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he wasn't warranted. The anger wasn't warranted. It was definitely warranted, you know? But I just like, think, hey. again, as a business owner, oh, as a professional, yeah. not even a business owner, just a professional, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I, so some people got mad at me, but I compared this to the cops. I'm like, so mm. everybody who is excusing him saying we're only human, why can't he be human? Okay, what happens when cops become human? When they get frustrated, when they're asking the dude, hey, freeze, and dude is still walking towards them. What, and then they lose their cool. Like, why are we, so we get mad if the cop loses his cool and he's human, but we, we're okay with a business owner slash attorney who loses his cool and goes off and embarrasses his establishment and his team. Like, no, like, let's be consistent professionals should always be held at a higher regard, period. Whether you're the business owner, whether you are just the manager or front staff hostess, whatever, you should be held to a higher standard. Because mm -hmm. again, as a professional, our goal is to diffuse conflict. You don't want to incite conflict. And I think the thing is the risk he ran with his reaction was what if one of those sisters had gotten on the phone and called their husband crying? Then mm -hmm. what, you know? Like, how would that, I mean, seriously, how would that turn out? What if they were brothers, young brothers cutting up in the restaurant? Would he have gone off like that? I don't know, right? So I just think we have to be careful when we stand behind and salute people meeting fire with fire, like especially professionals. I can understand if these were two consumers getting into it at a table, but as a professional, no, sir, I'm not with it. And again, I've been cursed out royally. I've been called all types of names by my people, but guess what? I maintain professionalism. I mm -hmm. may have wanted to, I was cursing them out in my head. I'm not going to lie. I was going off. But to them, I made sure I was professional and I was stern, but professional and I rectify the issue. And that's it. So I, I think that, uh, and one last thing I do want to say, I just want to close out with this uh, on this particular topic. For people who are saying them black women wouldn't go to a white establishment standing on their furniture twerking. You have never been to the sugar factory because I have been to the Sugar Factory, which is also kind of upscale and urban. They play a lot of hip hop music. The music is super loud. It's almost like a club and their prices are not cheap. A drink is gonna run you about 30, 
I have witnessed myself, women standing up on the furniture, twerking, throwing their uh, little napkins or whatever in the air, all of that. So again, we got to stop pathologizing black people. We got to stop doing that. Like those women, we don't know who they, they may be teachers, they may be nurses. Like we can't just assume that these women are strippers because they got hyped in the heat of the moment and decided to twerk in somebody's restaurant. So that's all I wanted to say. But the Sugar Factory is super lit for those of you who like that kind of vibe or environment. That's in Mississippi? There is one in Mississippi. The flagship store is in Vegas, or I'm sorry, flagship restaurant, because it was a store slash restaurant. Um, so the flagship site, I think, is in Vegas, but they have one in Miami, Vegas, and Biloxi, Biloxi Mississippi. That's the one where they be having all the damn candy on the drinks with the yes. smoke and all that it's, shit, right? It's nice, yeah. It's dope. Sugar Factory. Well, Maria... We appreciate you so much uh, for coming on the podcast. This has been an absolutely great episode. Could you please plug yourself in, let the people know where they can follow you, how they can get in contact with you if they want your services, anything you got to offer. Please just plug yourself and let the people know where they can find you. Yes, absolutely. So the best place to reach me is on my website, um, wordsarewealth.com, mm. wordsarewealth.com. Um, and so for my BWR family, I am actually releasing a book. I think by the time this gets published, the book will already be out. Mm. So for my BWR family, I am going to offer you a discount code on that book, free. The only thing you have to pay for is shipping and handling. That's it. So mm. free, only pay for shipping and handling. Again, wordsarewealth.com. And the passcode or the uh, discount code is BWR. So hey. wordsarewealth.com. Uh, again, the discount code is BWR, and that will be valid until March 2021. Hey, y'all get that book. It's about to be lit. I know it's about to be some value. It's, it's, in that a, book. it's a copywriting book. Or what's the topic of the book? It is. Yes. Yeah, so it's basically just how you can generate money with words. And it is focusing primarily on email, but there are some other subject matters that are being touched as well. Mm. Y'all tap in. I know y'all just heard all this value in Hell this yeah. podcast, man. Y'all better take advantage of that offer ASAP. ASAP. Mm. but yeah whenever it drop but um <laughs> once again like he said thank you so much maria uh we're gonna pivot we're gonna get into some house cleaning before we wrap up once again we want to thank all of the members of the bwr family for tuning in with us week in best. week out like like he said y'all the best uh thank you for just helping us grow thank you for sharing it with your family and friends y'all make sure y'all tap into our book also manage your money like the one percent tap into our course uh, credit fundamentals one-on-one we also have eight weeks of wealth available for, for purchase and we also doing a the special pack. yeah a special bundle called the wealth pack and we with need the clues bombs, man. <laughs> <laughs> with uh managing money like the one percent eight weeks of wealth and credit fundamentals one-on-one so y'all definitely definitely tap into that um jared our bro man david y'all got anything else y'all want to say uh, man, I just want to give the, the shout out to our people. Jared, Jared probably already on it. Yeah, I already got it up. Let's get uh, it. <clears throat> shout out to Ifant Du Solia. Uh, I Ooh, appreciate boy, you having... can't read French, huh? Nah, I can't at all. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate having the opportunity to listen to these pods and gain all the types of knowledge needed for our success. I play these while I work in my nine to five and will continue on once I start making my business. All right, what does that actually, uh, how is that supposed to sound? Uh, if find this soleil or something like that, I was looking at it. That's French, my brother. I was looking oh, at that. I, said, I don't know. Boy, you from North Louisiana for real. It's all good, man. Hey, <laughs> two different states. I promise you. But you get on. I speak two state. languages. Or excuse me, I speak three: English, Ebonics, and country. I don't, I don't know nothing about no French. <laughs> Don't know about no French. Hey, I man, out of y'all. <laughs> hey, y'all. We done. Hey, but always, y'all. As always, look. This Thank has been you, a great man. episode. Thank y'all for tuning in. Y'all catch us next week. We're going to have some more pressure coming y'all way. This is David with Black Wolf Renaissance signing out. Peace. I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot. Unless it's money on the phone. 